what I hope to do today is to cover um, giving some idea and understanding about some of the roles of stress and trauma and mental health in, uh, as risk factors for um, substance use and addictive behaviors, um, understand some of the basic neurobiological mechanisms um, behind that, um, understand protective factors in terms of looking at self-regulation and how that can be um, uh, an effective means not only of primary prevention but also for treatment and recovery. And then recognize how mindfulness-based practices can cultivate self-regulation um, and looking at the neurobiology and co cognition that comes along with that, some of the science that looks at how this can be so um, translational across different areas. And then explore some of the effective ways to integrate it not only into university, college, education settings, but also into um, preschool, um, middle school, high school, and community settings as well. So before we begin, let's all take a deep breath and kind of transition away from whatever uh, we were just doing on our way to get here. Maybe putting our cell phones aside. And just know that um, as we're going through the content or whatever, there's a lot of information, whatever, any point that you need to kind of come back and recenter that you have the skills to take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. So having said that, let's roll ahead. So first thing I wanted to do was to ask, um, just for some input from the audience, about why is it that people use alcohol and other drugs or engage in addictive behaviors? Yes, sir. Escapism. Escapism. Feels, Feels good. Pleasure. Self-soothing. Self Self-soothing, yes. So, so far I haven't heard anybody say because they're bad people, criminals, et cetera, or whatever. And so often that's the challenge is that we look at um, problematic aspects of this and not look at the, the whole person and the whole spectrum across the, the life. And so giving, getting that in mind, if we're looking at this is what people, if they're looking at engaging in self-soothing behavior to avoid unpleasant um, uh, moods or feelings um, and in inability to tolerate distress in other ways. So, that's one of the key things when we look at what mindfulness-based practices can bring to folks is ways to um, go within, drawing on our own resources and resiliency, regardless of what's going on around us, and to be able to redirect attention, to self-soothe, to re-regulate, and the like. So um, just really quickly, if we look at what some of the kind of common targets and risk factors are, not only for substance use, but also relapse, um, we look at issues of unaddressed traumatic stress, poor self-regulation skills, emotional dysregulation, anxiety, depression, <clears throat> exposure to violence. And then we look at what are some of the protective factors. And these are things that we look at that are strengthened, um, identified protective factors. And these are elements of the outcomes that there's a plethora of research on looking at mindfulness-based practices for cultivating these. Among them, distress tolerance, self-regulation skills, emotional regulation, psychological flexibility, right? Uh, getting away from some of the rigidity. Reduced anxiety, reduced depression, and a decrease in uh, traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress symptoms. One of the key things here, bringing it back to sort of the core of, of the, um, the program here at VCU, when we look at with college students, over the past decade, uh, the rates of stress, trauma, anxiety, depression have been concurrently increasing along with substance use related problems among young adults. So from the most recent um, American College Health Association <clears throat> data from uh, 2018, one of the key things here is this number may look relatively low. So it says 1.3% of students are diagnosed with a substance use disorder. We know that that's, that diagnosis and treatment is, a, is relatively low. 1% uh, diagnosed with behavioral addiction, but if we look at this even going back to 2015, that it represents a 30% increase. So it was a 0.8% in uh, 2015 were diagnosed and 0.5% uh, um, diagnosed with uh, addictive behaviors. Um, then we look at in terms of kind of what's going on with folks. So one of the things I was actually interested to see is that the, the percentage of students reporting, you know, what the category of binge drinking um, seems to be down uh, well, I used to work in student affairs and did direct services with substance abuse counseling with students at 
at SU, and our, our percentage of students that binge drank in the past two weeks generally hovered around 42%. Um, so 42% used cannabis in the past two weeks. Um, this percent, 3.3 percent, have used prescription opioids, and we know the importance in terms of the risks for um, lethality with that. Um, about 0.3 percent um, used heroin, and 3 percent abuse uh, sedative hypnotics. So this is looking at not using them for prescribed reasons, but looking at using them for uh, recreational reasons as well. Other key issues when we look at so um, substance use doesn't. Uh, exist in a vacuum. 22% reported being treated or diagnosed with anxiety, 18% treated or diagnosed with depression, and most treated with medication in both categories. 16% um, had seriously considered suicide. 85% felt overwhelmed, 53% felt hopeless. Then they looked at um, this was the first time I'd seen this uh, question and information on the American College Health Association survey, and they looked at sources of trauma and extreme distress. And as a faculty member, I can tell you that um, this, the issues that students come to class with and the inability to function um, is increasingly challenging. Um, and I particularly find that among young men, I don't know if it's because um, uh, they're more open to, to speaking with me about it, but a disproportionate percentage of young men um, really struggling with uh, basic mental health issues and trying to get through um, uh, the academic year. So 48% reported academics were a source of trauma, and I've never really looked at it. Um, source of stress, yes, but source of trauma, no. 15% um, reported dealing with a significant loss, so death of a family or, or a friend. Um, I surveyed students in my class. Uh, I surveyed them each semester for the um, past four years if they knew somebody who had died from an opioid overdose. And this past semester, 45% of the students directly knew someone who had died from an opioid overdose. And that's out of a class with 110 students. 30% um, reported this. Again, I was uh, uh, surprised to, I, to, to learn that 20 almost 30% reported that their personal appearance was a source of trauma and extreme distress. So I think this also speaks to some of the larger um, issues here as we're trying to, to look at how do we address these factors. This, I think, has a lot to do with when we look at social media, comparison, and the directed diversion and attention outwards about how we present ourselves to others. And so what this has to do with mindfulness is we're looking at you can't just keep Band-Aid picking on all of these different factors and trying to put out this fire and that fire, but going back into the individual and trying to work on core issues that apply across why these things become so distressful. Um, this is, I'm not going to read to you, but I just, um, the, the key thing is I think that I, by and large at universities and colleges, we do a pretty good job of providing education information, but what students lack, what when I'm not pointing just, just to students, but <laughs> humans uh, in the United States seem to lack, is personal um, uh, um, resiliency skills and self-regulation skills. And so they get a lot of information about alcohol and other drugs, um, stress reduction, um, but not, maybe not adequate information about how to deal with grief and loss um, in some regards. So the other factor, too, are those things that, that go on um, uh, in a larger context. And a lot of the work and the research I do around mindfulness has, to, um, has focused on working with um, uh, people with traumatic stress, so folks in the community exposed to violence, um, military veterans, survivors of sexual assault, um, survive, people who are survivors of childhood uh, abuse and violence as well. So one of the key things is that um, to note that anyone can experience trauma, and about 70% of adults in the United States are exposed to or experience a traumatic event at some point in their life, and about 20% of those individuals go on to develop what we would call post-traumatic stress. But if you're in environments of chronic, toxic, ongoing stress, it's not really post-traumatic stress, it's traumatic stress. Um, so one of the challenges with this is if we look at trauma and stress is that um, the part of the cognitive rigidity and then the physio physiological response that we have when we're constantly keyed up. So you're in the fight, 
flight or freeze mode, um, that people have a, what we call a smaller or shorter window of tolerance. Right? They feel dysregulated and in, unable to cope. It, they have a narrower and narrower band of how they do that. And so that's when we start to look at ways for self-soothing, ways for distracting attention and the like. So when you get hyper aroused, it's when you're looking at sleep problems, your people are constantly keyed up, they're aggressive, they're responsive. Um, if we look at hypo arousal, emotional numbing, difficulty with attention, um, disassociation, inability to cl think clearly, and people are very shut down. And so we reach out to substances, we reach out to our cell phones, we engage in other behaviors, trying to manage ourselves and keep ourselves within that shorter window of of tolerance. Um, I won't get into the neurophysiology of stress and trauma too much, but there are, when we talk about stress, when we talk about post-traumatic stress, people, you know, uh, the majority of people don't category, or don't clinically meet definitions of post-traumatic stress disorder, but there's a, a, a similarity in terms of acute stress and chronic stress and traumatic stress that's, that's occurring not only in terms of neurocognition, uh, um, what's happening in terms of uh, hormonal response, but also physiological sensations and the like. And so we look at sleep disturbances, substance use, depression, risk of suicide, are key factors that are common um, among both trauma and stress. And then uh, particularly problematic issues around traumatic stress or intrusive thoughts, uh, um, uh, nightmares, memories that you can't regulate and the like. And so we look at emotional numbing, right? How do we find ways to, to numb emotionally? And again, it's reaching outside of ourselves for substance use, technology, purchasing, you know, shopping, be, uh, um, addiction, um, uh, sex addiction, finding other ways to try to, to soothe ourselves and regulate those things. Um, I won't bore you too much with this, but I do have uh, some information uh, in here because I think it's really helpful to look at um, with mindfulness-based stress reduction, it, it's not just a singular session of like calming down and, and de-stressing and feeling good afterwards. If that happens, that's awesome. But it's really about retraining neural pathways and retraining cognition and being able to choose where you put your attention, recognize when you're starting to respond to situations, and then being able to de-escalate uh, yourself as needed. And so the um, important processes related to that, then we start to look at in terms of what is our natural stress response and what happens in terms of the, uh, the brain and the body. And so it's, if, we, it, if there's one key thing to, to um, understand from all these things is that what you think literally changes your physiology. You can change your um, endocrine response, you can change your um, neurotransmitters simply by looking at in terms of what you're, you are thinking and how you're responding to stress. Right? And if, you, if you're like, that's a bunch of hogwash or whatever, um, if, you, <laughs> if you ever uh, uh, have watched a scary movie or whatever, there's nothing that's really happening. Uh, you're watching something, you're thinking something, and you see how your body responds and reacts to that. So that's just a gross example in terms of those things. Um, but it does, it, in, it changes um, uh, not only cardiac uh, response, but it also looks at in terms of changing um, areas And when we constantly worry and think, and it's difficult not to these days, um, because as, I, as a society, we're very much on edge. We're at a very divisive uh, point um, right now politically, socially, and that really uh, affects everybody. Right? We start to see these numbers in terms of how youth are responding to things. The adults are feeling it as well. And so when you're constantly thinking about uh, some of the other aspects or whatever, we strengthen you know, the old adage of neurons that uh, fire together, wire together, and that uh, rumination, fear, whatever, that strengthens those, those, uh, those, those mechanisms. So flipping back then to some of the other aspects in terms of, of this isn't about just what's happening at, uh, in young adulthood and what's happening in adulthood, but there's an increasing recognition in terms of the research that comes out, has come out around adverse childhood experiences and things that we may or may not put the pieces together, but how these affect people, and it doesn't matter if you're an infant and you're two weeks old and you're pre-verbal, um, you're five years old or whatever, there are, there's an imprint and there's a shift in terms of what occurs with folks. And so some of this has to do with self-regulation and some of it has to do with um, neurobiology risks.
but we see that the, the risks for being a heavy drinker, um, the risks for being an injection drug user, the risks for smoking cannabis, for violence, et cetera, increase um, the more that people have been exposed to adverse childhood experiences. And, and this ranges from everything from uh, the dissolution of a, uh, of a family, so, which can, can be divorce or can be a significant relationship that, that shifts, to uh, family members that are incarcerated, witnessing violence and the like. One of the things that's particularly interesting too is that um, intergenerational um, trauma and um, adverse childhood experiences, trauma as an adult or whatever, what, these, um, what also happens is that there can be a dysregulation of the endocannabinoid system. So the endocannabinoid system we all have in our body, it responds to um, um, our own um, endogenous neurotransmitter anandamide and it also responds to endorphins. And these things can get dysregulated. And there's some fascinating new research that shows that um, people with post-traumatic stress have a proliferation in their brain of the receptor sites, the CB1 receptors, for, um, which are the receptor sites that work with uh, endocannabinoids. Um, I'm sorry, not with endocannabinoids, but with endogenous and exogenous ca cannabinoids. So one of the things that I think that this is really helpful to look at is when people, uh, if we look at, you know, what is the motivation for using cannabis? It can be recreational relaxation or thrill-seeking, whatever. But then for people who continue to use it and, and use it compulsively, a lot of that also has to do with that it's providing them with uh, um, a positive reinforcement to, to meet a need of dysregulation on a physiological and a cognitive basis. And so I think that's helpful then to look at in terms of um, um, again, moving back away from the, the judgment aspect of why people are using certain substances and recognizing the um, benefits they may be receiving from it, but helping people to find another way that's not going to um, uh, be disruptive to clear thinking, um, sometimes uh, problematic depending on what state and where you live in terms of, of legal complications and the like. Um, but it's an important really, there, and we're just on the precipice of understanding this. We really just recognized and identified in the 90s um, the, the um, uh, neurotransmitters that are key to this. Um, the other thing, too, when we look at trauma and stress is that there's a bidirectional, bidirectional relationship between the two. And so if we look at the, um, how we're re um, uh, responding physiologically um, impacts um, our psychology and how what's going on with us psychologically impacts us physiologically. And so if you look at, if you, if you actually start to dig into things, all actions originate from physiological cues and, and, uh, and um, signaling. So even though if you talk about, um, well, I was stressed about something and stress is a, might be a perception of something, the real origins of it come from a physiological sensing. And so even though we're talking about mindfulness, it's really mind-body connection. And, and we have pretty much become cut off in terms of you know, uh, two different aspects of that. And so um, when, when we aren't able to regulate these things, um, uh, then we are at increased risk for developing substance use disorders and addictive behaviors, and also for relapse as well. Um, if we tie the pieces together again, the adverse uh, or traumatic experiences can be in, a, in childhood, it can be in, a, in adulthood or whatever. The natural response is again, fight, flight, or freeze in terms of what, what happens acutely. But then the protective components afterwards, and we're looking at in terms of hypervigilance, hyperreactivity, and numbing um, of physical sensations, numbing of uh, emotional reactivity. And so these neurobiological sensations that we have in the body, there's also changes in the brain because in order to be hyper alert, you have to have um, the, the amygdala is kind of the driver and the uh, security guard overrides uh, most of the other um, uh, uh, processes. And so the, the security guard, you're always looking for threats and incoming information and that's, that's more dominant than the prefrontal cortex, which is um, essential for taking in information, short-term memory, making good judgments, and the like. So in order to, man to manage some of these things, you know, the reliable ways, um, not necessarily healthy, but predictable, reliable ways of 
numbing oneself, shutting down hypervigilance can be alcohol, other drug use, uh, um, disordered eating, and the like. So I'm setting it up to look pretty grim and disappointing, but I, wanna, I want people to understand also this aspect of there's tremendous um, resiliency uh, that comes out of suffering. And what we're really looking at is post-traumatic growth and resiliency that we're, that we're fostering um, through these practices. And this, um, I don't know if you know this, the, uh, understand sort of the significance of the lotus flower, but the lotus flower will not grow in clear, clean water. It'll only grow in brackish, muddy, uh, 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 poor, you know, poor conditions. And so um, out of this sort of ground of suffering or out of the chaos and the muck or whatever, beautiful things can come. And it's exactly in the muddy waters where the lotus flower grows and blooms. And so taking that and reframing, um, helping people to understand kind of what their history is or maybe con contextualizing some of what they've experienced, but then also looking at the tr uh, profound resiliency of that. And I think I'm probably preaching to the choir because one of the things that we love about working with um, uh, in this field is the tremendous resiliency that, that people um, bring to it um, despite all of the suffering. So if we go back to you know, some very basic elements and we start to look at in terms of uh, sort of brain operations and the neuroscience of uh, craving cues and addiction, um, the, our senses, so again going back to this idea that things that, that um, at all actions originate from sensing, is that there's smell, sight, touch, sound, taste, that things that we may or may not be aware of that can be, that are, that are the initiation of triggers for craving. And so um, anybody who um, has ever tried to um, uh, change a behavior, particularly if you're looking around um, chemical dependency, whether it's nicotine, whether it's an opiate, whether it's alcohol, whether it's food or whatever, there are not only the people, places, and things that can be triggers, but there are, are subtle cues and things that we can may pick up on, a slight scent of something that um, starts your mind thinking in a, a different area. And so, again, going back into what do mind-body practices do, they help us to get in touch with um, recognizing on a very subtle level what these sensations are and what's happening. So you can choose a response to that. So... Uh, if we look at, at um, behavior change or prevention around these things as sort of the habit loop and how you can become aware of what's happening in the habit loop and then learn to choose and change a response to that, the first point that's um, essential is to, to see, does, the, does this thing show up anywhere? Maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure, is to recognize and understand sort of what are the tri triggers, what are the stresses, what is the physical discomfort, what is the reaction, right? And so even the behavior of like, if you're starting to get bored now and check your cell phones or whatever, that aspect of boredom, right? That key sense of I'm losing attention, I'm lost, this is too complicated, I don't wanna hear or whatever. Trigger, I know how to reward myself or whatever. I will look on, I will look on Instagram for cute puppy pictures or something. <laughs> and it becomes a reward, re reinforcing reward uh, pattern of behavior. But on other more problematic aspects, it can be um, turning to alcohol, it can be shopping addiction, it can be binge eating, um, all types of things. And so we do these things. This is all part of the brain. This is set, we're set up in terms of uh, the survival, right? We're operating just the way we were designed um, because it's a learned behavior and it's a re reinforcing and rewarding, so we do it again. So this was important for us to be able to, like as uh, cave people, to be able to forage and figure out like where the good mushrooms were versus the poisonous bad mushrooms, and then we could learn that we could go over here and get these and avoid those. It's the same mechanisms that are in place there, right? So we're operating as we were desi as designed to do, but it's important to become aware of what these are and what the triggers are so you can interrupt and change the cycle or choose, choose a different response and behavior. It's also layered on top of when we look at in terms of the, the, our brain processes, there's s suffering is at the core there. Suffering is at the core. So it's not just suffering in terms of um, extreme examples of trauma that we might be thinking about, but boredom for many people feels like suffering, 
right? And so the brain is craving relief from what, they, what you perceive to be an unpleasant experience or situation. Um, this is, uh, um, there will be a quiz on this afterwards, so I'm gonna <laughs> hope that you take this. But this is actually an important piece, um, uh, and, and the resources are on the uh, PowerPoint or the PDF that are gonna be listed there, so if you wanna get into reading about these things afterwards, but one of the key things to look at in terms of um, understanding self-regulation, which goes back to where we direct our attention and how we respond to, to things, um, at the core of that, when we look at with um, mindfulness-based practices, is working with what's called the default mode network. So our default mode network is what we were just talking about. I'm bored, um, my mind starts wandering, I'm going off into all these different aspects, next thing you know you're down a rabbit hole, whatever. And um, the default mindfulness-based practices, particularly meditation, where you're training attention again and again to come back to the other areas, strengthens what's called the task-positive network and quiets what's called the, the default mode network. And so the um, cool thing is that the research shows that a reduction in terms of default mode network activity reduces mind wandering, and that's not just so you can do well in school or whatever, but mind wandering is a, um, a risk factor in terms of depression, um, substance use, and the like. Why, why might that be? Doesn't mean like that uh, uh, boredom and creative thinking is, is bad. But what happens is, if you're looking at in terms of mind wandering, it's, it's closely tied with rumination, right? And so rumination on the past is associated with depression and rumination and fear about the future is associated with anxiety. And these things can be huge triggers for um, developing unhealthy behaviors and huge triggers and risks for, for relapse as well. Um, so for mindfulness meditation helps in terms of not only, uh, of working with an underlying, some of the key risk factors, underlying factors looking at uh, related to trauma, related to stress, just regular stress, and also relating to craving. Right? And the craving mind, as we said before, it's craving sometimes just to feel pleasure. It's not necessarily meaning that you're in a um, uh, full-blown um, uh, craving cycle with an opioid addiction or for alcohol but it's also that craving for things to be other than they are. And so these are, what's helpful with this is it's a non-pharmacological means of managing anxiety, depression, unpleasant um, uh, mood states, working with cravings, right? If anybody's ever tried to stop um, uh, smoking, um, recognizing and knowing what, the, what those craving cycles are uh, with nicotine. And it's also what we call an upstream prevention uh, basis. So preventing problems beforehand. And so um, I'll whip through ahead afterwards and look at um, this work can be done with three and four year olds. Right? And so you're looking at primary prevention and how do, we, how do we work at these factors as well. So um, one of the things I love about mindfulness-based practices is that they are sustainable. Once people learn them, they have the skills, they have the internal resources. You can't stop the uh, stuff that's coming at you um, or the waves from coming, but you can learn to surf and kind of ride the chaos a little bit. Ultimately, these practices, um, I know that, that it can be very expensive to get trained um, and the like or whatever, but there's um, wonderful programs such as Brown University just got a, a, a substantial endowment where they're trying to bring free mindfulness training online and in the community to uh, the masses. There's a lot of good reputable resources because ultimately it's a skill you have within you. And so if you don't, most people don't have access to good mental health services. Right? Um, even as somebody who works in the field, um, when I was um, trying to get help for um, family members, incredibly difficult, even for people with insurance. And so um, it's important not only for prevention, but also um, uh, for uh, sustained recovery as well. And ultimately, they're self-directed strategies. You can reset yourself. You learn to tolerate distress and anxiety on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, day-to-day -day basis. And you can learn to intervene and, uh, with unhealthy and addictive behaviors and redirect your attention. So now here's for the, uh, real, the research results from um, some of the work I've done. So if you would like to take a nap, feel free to go, go ahead and do so. I will not 
Um, but I felt that it was important since this is a, a research to practice aspect to put some of this information in here. And so these are just some of the key findings and outcomes from um, my, um, for five years now I've been doing research on integrating mindfulness-based practices into curriculum in courses and measuring the outcomes. So we have control classes and then we have intervention courses. Um, fortunately for me, it's, uh, the one aspect is it's a course um, called Cognitive Behavioral Stress Reduction, so it naturally fits right in there. But I have a lot of colleagues who are um, integrating these practices into um, rhetorical studies, interpersonal communication skills, um, uh, mindful drawing in, in the visual performing arts and the like or whatever. And what we found is that over the course of the semester, um, significant reductions in trade anxiety, so we're not just looking at state anxiety, but really changing in terms of trade anxiety, significant in increases in mindful awareness, um, increases in self-acceptance, which I think is key when we go back to looking at the um, statistic that said 30% of students find that their personal appearance is a source of trauma and extreme distress. Um, uh, significant reductions in using cell phone to regulate emotions and sig significant reductions in the use of cell phones to avoid unpleasant feelings. Um, these are a bunch of graphs, so I'll just show you so you can not have to uh, read through stuff or whatever. But the turquoise line is the class that had the, uh, or the uh, students who've had the mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction curriculum integrated into their coursework. Uh, the control group, um, these are, this is data collected during the same semester. So you control for all those factors that kind of go on, you know, the, the academic trajectory uh, life cycle. And so for self-regulation, uh, um, the darker line is the control group, no change over the semester. Mindfulness, so here, of course, you'd expect to see significant improvements in that, but the key thing if you look at mindfulness measurement constructs is it's looking at fostering psychological flexibility. It's looking at fostering observing capacity for self and others. It's looking at self-acceptance, acceptance of others, cultivation of awareness, and the like. Using phone to escape difficult emotions. So um, the, the interestingly, too, this control class here is a course um, that I teach on um, addiction. It's called Dynamics of Addiction. So these students are getting the cognitive information about being aware of technology addiction, substance use addiction, or whatever. So it looks at that importance between it's not just what do you know, but how, how do you apply these things? What kind of skills can you have to, to change these aspects? Uh, this is another wave of data, so looking at um, anxiety, and so measuring it at the beginning of the sort of intervention, eight weeks into the semester, and then at the end of the semester, so that the, the mindfulness practice and training that um, is integrated into the coursework occurs in the first couple months of the semester. And to see that, that the um, uh, results and the changes hold at least for a month afterwards is, is good to see. In the absence of any intervention, that um, it just increases uh, for the students. So then now let's look at primary prevention. So I've done, um, had the opportunity to do some fantastic uh, research um, with uh, schools where they're already integrating uh, these practices. So I've done some with preschools, done some with sixth graders in the Boston area, um, in the Philadelphia school district, and we're trying to do it um, in Syracuse uh, City as well. And so um, what we found is that, um, that it fosters self-regulation. So there's an adolescent self-regulation inventory. Interestingly, as many times as we've used the same instruments in different studies, short-term uh, self-regulation doesn't seem to, to change, and that's more or less the things like where I might be able to um, hold back the impulse to just poke you because I'm bored or whatever, and you're sitting next to me, and we're in fifth grade, and I, I'm, I'm bored. But long-term self-regulation, so those things that are needed in order to goal plan and to, to stay on track and to do things that are in your own best interest so you can move on to the next thing, there's um, significant improvements in that. Um, with preschoolers, we found that um, it significantly increases what they call effortful control and attention. And that's pretty fantastic to be able to, to do that as well. Now, the preschoolers were not filling out surveys. It was um, direct assessments. So if you're familiar with things like the marshmallow test and, and those types of things, um, it was things like that. More graphs, um, that, uh, but just basically looking at this was um, with sixth graders in the um, uh, Boston area, 
The blue lines are the intervention groups. The red lines are the control groups. And um, this is data where we're looking at this is uh, total uh, overall self-regulation, and this is long-term self-regulation. What's important I, or in, interesting to me also is not only that there's improvements where they integrated mindfulness into um, the curriculum, but in the absence of anything, what do we see with the red line? So there's decreases in self-regulation over the course of the academic year in the absence of anything. Um, with this study, too, the, um, another great thing is this was integrated into the English language arts, or would be like your English class or reading class. And they, uh, for one minute at the beginning of class, three times a week, they would do a single yoga pose and a 30-minute sitting meditation. And so what we found was, it doesn't have to be an elaborate program, but it was routine, it was continuous training, because when we look at how do we regular, um, uh, what do I say, strengthen the uh, neural networks that help us to direct our attention and help us to self-regulate, it comes back to regular sustained practice over time. Oh, there we go, 10 minutes, thank you. Um, and so, um, again, something you don't have to go to an ashram somewhere and, and uh, um, uh, uh, take it all on, but it is important that the person who's leading the practices has, believes in them, has experience with them, um, and can present it. Because in other words, if you're like, all right, everybody stand up, do a yoga move, sit down, okay, now we're going to go on. That's not going to be very effective, right? It's, it's bringing it into these uh, key aspects. Uh, let's see, what am I doing here? The other thing, so... Um, I was looking around for information. I was super excited to find that there is a program here in Richmond. There's a whole bunch of uh, different programs. So if we're looking at other aspects of um, how, do we, uh, how do you take this information and apply it to the work you're doing. So um, this woman, um, I'm remembering her first name is Nikki Myers, I think it is. She has Yoga 12 Step for Sustainable Recovery. So I think it's Y12SR. Um, and there's some research uh, links on there or whatever, but the idea, or what they do is they integrate both the 12-step processes and the elements of yoga and yogic practices in terms of fostering, um, taking the same constructs and the same steps that you're going through that, but then finding how does this apply and layer over it in terms of real embodiment and physicality um, for cultivation and training of these different factors. This was some... Um, it can also be, um, I also love this practice because uh, language can often be a barrier. I do work around the world. Um, I had a Fulbright Fellowship and I was in uh, the Republic of Georgia, which you can see over here, it's squeezed between uh, Russia and uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey. And these were therapists that work with torture survivors and uh, burnout was extremely high among them, secondary trauma and the like. And so. Um, we worked on doing training to um, uh, teach them mindfulness-based practices and found that it um, helped to mediate um, burnout. And um, while they increased in terms of empathy and were able to be effective with the folks they were working with, it helped them to be able to sort of not take on all the suffering that they were exposed to, but to be able to be with people and then be able to step away from that when they needed to later. Uh, Africa Yoga Project, um, this is some super cool uh, uh, work as well. And so looking at, again, low cost, no cost, self-directed, um, limited resources, whatever, but looking at ways for in terms of, um, of prevention and recovery from trauma and stress. Um, so this is just looking at, these were some Maasai warriors. This was in um, a prison in Kenya. Um, and that's a community program as well. Um, direct mechanisms of how does um, uh, mindfulness help relate to substance use prevention. So the att mindful attention helps to re reduce cravings because you're able to recognize physiologically where are these cravings and these sensations starting to originate. Whether it's a sensation from an unpleasant feeling that's a craving for a way to alleviate it or what. There's been some great research done around, particularly with nicotine, um, uh, and more, um, and also with opioids. So Eric Garland's work around that. Mindful attention um, reduces neural activity in terms of the areas that get strengthened, because we know that 
um, the processes and the it's a learned behavior. And so the, the go-to means of how do I respond to unpleasant feelings and, and emotions or whatever has been to reach for whatever the substance or behavior is that helps to alleviate that. Um, and the key thing here is not, it's again, not just knowing like this is not uh, uh, helpful for me, but how do I change and strengthen the, the neural uh, connectivity in the areas that I are uh, in my own best interest or in the interest of folks so that I can uh, make an informed choice rather than um, just falling um, to a reaction that I'm used to doing. And again, going back to the default mode network. So reduction in default mode ne network activity um, and reducing in terms of, of mind wandering has been shown to be key for um, improving um, sustained recovery as well. Um, some of the indirect influences uh, is that it mediates anxiety and mediates uh, um, persistent depression. Um, and so it, since those factors are often co-occurring um, with and precipitate um, uh, substance use and relapse risks or whatever, it's important to get those under, uh, um, be able to, to manage those in effective ways as with uh, post-traumatic stress. Um, let's see, I'm going to whip through this. I just wanted to show real quick, we're looking at sort of um, from a, a basic stress as well as trauma um, component. If we look at how the brain uh, naturally responds to stress, the activity in the prefrontal cortex, um, which is our new brain and where our thinking occurs, that tends to be uh, weakened and kind of damped down. The thalamus is the area that takes in all sort of sensory information. And so when we look at interoception um, and sensing within the body, proprioception, sensing around the body or whatever, that's where that input comes into. But under nor normal circumstances, the, the amygdala, so the amygdala is our security guard that's kind of driving things. These two areas get strengthened, right? So um, we are reacting in terms of uh, personal safety and security. And the prefrontal cortex is not so connected. So what with mindfulness-based meditation, um, and mindfulness-based practices, including yoga and, and the like, um, it helps and it changes the thought processes and the response and sort of slows things down. And what happens is then we see that the thalamus, which is our sensing input, um, and the prefrontal cortex, though the connection between those two areas gets strengthened. So you're aware of what's coming in and what, what's going on or whatever, and you're able to choose a response rather than just to react. The amygdala takes secondary, um, uh, takes a back seat in that regard. So um, in terms of looking at um, how you apply mindfulness skills in terms of responding to triggers and cues, uh, that the circuits in the neural networks that, you, you, that get strengthened, you can establish and it's easier to cultivate new behaviors and to become aware of what's happening so you can interrupt sort of the habit loop. Um, it's a decoupling of the behavior, and it provides people with a little bit of distance so that they can sort of observe what's going on in that context as well. Um, this is, again, I'm going to whip through some of these things. These are super helpful. This is from um, some research, again, by Eric Garland, and where he looks at in terms of how does the mindfulness-based intervention, um, how do these techniques help? What are they? So the key elements of mindfulness-based practices and prevention is um, awareness of breath, breathing, meditation, body scanning, so sensing, um, connecting um, closely and becoming aware of small vibration sensations within the body so that we have a connection between mind and body, being aware of craving response, um, and then um, also some things like moving, yoga, and then bringing it into your everyday life so we look at informal practices. Um, the biological mechanisms, so amplifying and strengthening prefrontal cortex activity, um, the uh, decreasing the limbic system, so that's where the amygdala is in our, our reactivity process, sort of the old brain, and improving sort of autonomic regulation. So autonomic regulation, if we're looking at the autonomic nervous system, the two key areas are the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Sympathetic is activation and everything's jacked up, and parasympathetic helps to slow things down. Way to keep that in mind is like a parachute, bringing things into. And so being able to physiologically um, respond to, to those key things. Um, we restructure the reward process, right? So recognizing that and looking at internal mechanisms for that. Um, 
and you can uh, read through the other key things. But one of the key things too here is we're looking at decreasing drug Q reactivity, right? So if you something that you might smell, see, uh, pick up on physical sensations or whatever that otherwise might be a strong uh, risk for using again or using initially as well. Um, this is another graph and an image from uh, uh, Eric Garland's work um, and looking at understanding the mechanisms of, of, um, of how mindfulness can help in terms of these, these factors and the processes. And I won't get into all the key things here, but the interoception, right, you're looking at understanding the physiology and physical aspects of what's going on within you. What are you feeling and what are you sensing? Is it hunger? Is it anger? and being able to then choose a response to that. Appraising what's happening in a more uh, objective, uh, distanced way. Urge surfing. So one of the, the great things when we look at here with uh, Alan Marlett's work around um, mindfulness-based relapse prevention. So again, this goes back to that idea of you can't change everything that's coming at you, but you can learn to sit, you know, sort of uh, surf and ride the waves of, of chaos and stress. And with um, craving uh, intensity, and we're looking at in terms of trying to change patterns of behavior, um, the understanding that, that any craving has about a 15 to 20 minute window and time period is really, really helpful for folks. Because other words, that craving feels like it is unending, unyielding, intolerable, and you, you figure, I just, I'm just going to give in to it because then I can get on with things because other words, I, I can't. And so what it, um, the skills, that, the ability to watch what's happening with yourself during a craving process, to be able to tolerate, expand that window of tolerance and, and deal with that. And if you make it out of it, then on the other side without using, right, you get to see what the picture of it is. And, and what the research shows when they, when they um, with this is that the intensity of the craving subsides over time. Not just because time passes, but that um, uh, objective capacity to observe what's going on with yourself and give yourself some distance. So I am not my craving. I'm a person who has experienced a craving. That's a difference in terms of that, that context. Um, these are skills for working through urge surfing. So this will be on the PowerPoint that you can read afterwards. Um, this is just some diagrams for understanding kind of tracking and sensing um, so that you um, become familiar with when you're feeling good as well as when, when things aren't going well and you can catch those triggers beforehand. Um, hopefully this is a, a, a rehash of things I covered before and I think I'm out of time. So um, I just wanna bring it back to closing it out again and to, to um, encourage people to look into more of the, this work and the, the research around this and to also understand the context of, again, the, uh, even though there's stress and trauma, it's an opportunity for resiliency and growth and that we're not broken, um, but it's just like when a, a bone uh, heals or whatever, it heals stronger. And um, out of uh, suffering comes beautiful things as well.